Thank you, Stephanie, and welcome to everyone. Um, it's good afternoon here in New York, where I'm based, and potentially good morning or good evening, wherever you are in the world. We're very happy to have you with us this month. Uh, for our Institute of Coaching webinar on the alchemy of trust, neuroscience, and the coaching relationship. I'm particularly excited to be able to uh, bring you my colleague, a fellow with the Institute of Coaching, and my dear friend Judith Glazer to be with us today. I've been working with, on Judith for a long time and very, very excited to get her to finally be with us. Um, before we get started, I just want to, for those of you who are not familiar with Judith, and I'm sure many of you are, I'd just like to uh, give a little bit of her background and also to remind you, as Stephanie said, we will take questions throughout the webinar, um, but we'll take breaks at various times in the presentation and, and be happy to share those questions with Judith. So the, as Stephanie mentioned, you want to write your, your comments or your questions in the chat box. Um, and we'll find time to try to get to as many questions as possible during the session. So a little bit about Judith. Uh, she has a very lengthy and impressive background, and I don't want to take up too much of our time going through the entire, her entire bio, but I will share with you that she considers herself to be an organizational anthropologist, which I actually love that title. She is one of the most pioneering and innovative change agents, consultants, and executive coaching executive coaches in the consulting and coaching industry and is really considered one of the world's leading authorities on conversational intelligence, we-centric leadership, and neuroscience-related innovation. She's the best-selling author of over seven books, including her latest book, which I highly encourage you to get a hold of. It's really great, called Conversational Intelligence, How Great Leaders Build Trust and Get Extraordinary Results. Through the application of the neuroscience of we to business challenges, Judith shows CEOs and leaders how to elevate levels of engagement, collaboration, and innovation to positively impact the bottom line. She's the founder and CEO of a company called Benchmark Communications and the chairman of the Creating We Institute, with a total of over 35 years of business experience working with CEOs and their teams in establishing we-centric cultures poised to strategically handle business challenges in the face of moving targets. She serves as an adjunct professor at Wharton. She's been a guest speaker at Harvard, at MIT, at Kellogg, at Loyola, at University of Chicago, at NYU. I could go on and on. She has been awarded a research fellowship from Drexel University, where she earned a master's degree in human behavior and, and development and has done additional graduate work at the Bales School of Social Research at Harvard and also the University of Pennsylvania. Needless to say, Judith is really one of the most well-known practitioners and um, innovators in the space that, of connecting neuroscience research with executive coaching and leadership development. As I said before, she's a colleague of mine, she's a fellow with the Institute of Coaching, a dear friend, and I am very honored to have her with us today. So let me give a rousing welcome to you, Judith. Hello oh, there. Je <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. It's, uh, it's been so wonderful. And I have to say that as a friend of mine, you really have encouraged me to continue to keep my feet on the ground while my head's in the, in the sky, <laughs> in the clouds around this work and I love our conversations because they always challenge me to think in new ways and I hope that this session today will invite all of you uh, online to um, continue to think deeply. I'm sure you're here because you're curious and want to discover some new things, uh, maybe validate and this is what I find a lot because right now I'm working with um, uh, 1,250 coaches who are being certified in this work in 75 countries and it's amazing this cohort is like you I'm sure going to be challenging uh, me to speak more deeply as much as I can now at this point in time to, to share this work with you. So I'm, I have a lot of photographs and pictures and things that you can see as well so it's not all going to be words it's going to be visuals um, as well and I hope that you will ask Jeff questions I hope I can answer them um, and let me take you into the door behind this incredible picture um, that talks about conversational intelligence and trust. Um, so let's see. Uh, you will find that I like to pop different things in that at first might not seem related, so be patient with me because my mind does those things. Um, and this is a picture of Jodie Foster. 
Um, it turns out that uh, if I ask the question, where does Jodie Foster live in, the, in our brain, in the brain, um, uh, maybe even in her brain, where does Jodie Foster live? So Jeff, I'm going to ask people, where does, a, do people live in our brain? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little scary to think of Jodie Foster living in my brain, but good yeah. choice. <laughs> <laughs> so anybody, if you wanted, you wanted to say anything, it could be funny or it could be, you know, grounding. Um, but I will share with you something about the research on this. If anybody has anything, Jeff, or not, because I could, I could get caught up and only do eight slides. So you have to push me to stay on track, okay? <laughs> Yeah, I know we're getting a bunch of comments about being oh, in, in memory. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, a lot of people are saying that, that mm -hmm. she's in the emotional center. Yep. Um, hippocampus. Mm -hmm. Oh, we have yep. some people who know the, who know the lingo. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> yeah, there's a lot of that. So hippocampus for me, when I say that word, it's like a big hippo that has a great memory. It's big and it holds a lot and it does and it, it tends to map um, lots of things. People, it, it maps conversations. Um, if a scientist could go in and sometime we will have the equipment to do it to actually read how to read that we have an imprint of almost everything that we're conscious of in that part of our brain so that we can go back to it. And there were some researchers who said, well, I really want to know where Jodie Foster lives because, you know, I know that the guy that we're going to put this fMRI on is really in love with her. And so um, what they did is they, they did do the fMRI and they had a great study and studying it has been the challenge for all of us is studying coaching, studying what it takes takes to, to be a good coach. Um, all of these things, it's just an incredible thing to double click. That's one of the words that we use in conversational intelligence to go deeper into what we're learning and even question and challenge if we've gotten at the right level um, in order to answer the question. Well, the study that was done on Jodie Foster, and I apologize because I did not get the link, um, is, and that's why, how to find the neuroscience methodologies that we can actually trust to get the answers to the questions that we as coaches want to know about coaching. Anyway, they put this fMRI on. They gave her lots of questions with Jodie Foster sprinkled throughout the questions, but not necessarily in a way that a person could tell that's what they were fishing on or about. But anyway, it turns out every time her name was mentioned, a place in the brain lit up, and the, the theory behind it, which I've constructed um, a combination of reading literature and making stuff up, which I do very well, and then find out that I can prove it later, um, a lot of you who have intuition about this stuff know what I'm talking about. Um, anyway, it turns out that there is a place in the brain and around that it stores good feelings and good experiences as well as bad. They're recorded there in some kind of special vault about every single person we've met. We know it when we see it with dogs who have been separated from their owners, um, who have gone away to war. When they come back, instantly the dog remembers every single thing about that person, jumps up, even the name gets mentioned, they can smell them before they come into the door. Human beings have that connection with uh, each other as well, maybe not as per pronounced as some of the things we see with animals. But that's why this area of trust is so important, knowing how people feel about us, our interaction dynamics, um, whether when we walk into a room, we experience them, we, we, everything from the moment we walk in, we sense another human being's trustability. And that's why I brought up this particular slide. <clears throat> it's hardwired, it's how we, it's how we work as humans. Um, one of the things that enables us, so we have this feeling for other people, we, we save it, we store it, and then we label it. Here's one of the things that actually uh, disables us a little bit, um, and if we know it, then it enables us to connect with other human beings and begin to build and strongly access our trust networks is, is the following. Take a look at this. This is called reality gaps, and it turns out that every human being maps their reality different from others, even if we're in the same room. Um, experiencing the same meeting when people walk out and they realize that they didn't take away the same content, it's because we're not just listening to what's happening in the room, we're thinking about and talking to ourselves about what's going on and so as a result we have a thing called reality gaps. If you take a look at this, I'll let you look at the visual. Um, keeping in mind that the small universe is one, one position, we're down on the ground and we see a tree from one perspective because that's how close we are to it and that's what our mind is, has and mapping, and so we stay close to that tree as a small universe, but sometimes we see it as a bigger universe, whether it's a leader who gets to see the world around them and then zooms into their company 
if they don't zoom in but they stay high, they have a, a, this big universe compared to employees' um, smaller universe, but it's only small in some ways. It's big and then it has a focus on what's happening on the ground. And so a lot of times leaders um, who sit on top of companies who aren't engaged with what's going on in the conversation actually have a completely different view. And I'm sure as coaches you've worked with these leaders who seem to think that they know it all and um, take dominant roles, um, position themselves um, as top-down power-centric leader, power over others, maybe not realizing that these are issues that they are creating. Um, and part of it has to do with this thing called reality gaps. So let me see if I'm going to be able to, yes, good. So um, I started looking at mirror neuron research when I, in 1986 when I um, created my first major program to help companies shift from I-centric to we-centric and to learn how to engage at higher levels with each other. I didn't know as much as I know now. Um, and you know that every time you, you learn more, you feel like you know less. Um, and at the time, I wasn't going into the special research in journals. These are things that I was picking out of articles. You can see the Harvard Business Review. These are 1989. These are things that were behind my research on um, rapport, which has turned into mirror neurons, which has turned into all sorts of things about knowing that human beings cannot live without connecting, that when we are not doing our work, we're thinking about other people in some way or another. Um, so one of the things that I did pick up back then that I wanted to show you, which is really fascinating, is um, some neuroscience studies that were done. And this was particular one was done by Itzik Bentov in his book, In Stalking the Wild Pendulum. And he said, um, what if we put a whole bunch of clocks in a room together um, and they had pendulums and we swung all the pendulums at different speeds and we came back or watched but in, within a certain amount of time, what would happen to those clocks? And Jeff, what do you think would happen to those pendulum clocks? Um, all set in different directions, but within two minutes, what, what do you think would happen? I am guessing that maybe they would all get into a consistent rhythm somehow. Yep. In fact, they did. But I have no idea how. <laughs> yeah, nor, nor, did, nor did Yitzhak Bentov, but boy, did he get excited about that. He said, if that's and that, what happens to clocks, what's going to happen to humans? And he started to study real deeply something that ultimately became part of the study of mirror neurons, which we know a little bit about because it's most recent. Um, and this research, if you recall, and for those online who remember or read this and those who haven't, um, the science, couple scientists were studying what goes on in monkeys' heads when you put them in the room together. And um, they had put the fMRI on their heads, the monkeys' heads, to record what was going on. And the little monkey on the right got really curious about what was going on with the monkey on the left. They are just like us. Um, and so they gave a cup to the monkey on the left and watched what happened with the monkey on the right. And it turned out that that monkey started to stare at the other monkey. And curiously, they started to find that their brain waves went into the same pattern. So we know that, and this was done in 1999, um, um, I believe. Um, it was in Parva, Italy. This may not have been the first time it was done. Um, but when it did take place, it, we, the mapping showed up in other places very quickly because it, the curiosity around, do we have something which ultimately became mirror neurons? Does that exist in the brain and in the prefrontal brain, which is where it was discovered? And so there's tons and tons of research about this. Knowing how scientists work, some people say, oh, there's a new wave that says there's no such thing as mirror neurons. Um, I even got called by somebody who is um, doing scientific work and said they don't exist. And then I asked them, well, have you ever seen Yuri Henson's, uh, Hessen's work from Princeton? And they said, no. And I said, I think you ought to take a look at it because it's 30 years of studying this. And in fact, it does exist. So you know if you're scientists in, on the line that we are always arguing about who's right. And there is still some questions about a lot of the things I'm talking about. There's still points of view on either side. Um, and I think you as a coach need to choose what gives you confidence, what enables you to experiment, um, you know, what are the things that you believe in around the science? I want to connect something for you that is pretty profound for me in my life as well. It shows you about connectivity, about trust, and about how that takes place even on our cellular level. Um, and this is what is beyond my, my belief, but I know it's true because my husband spent 10 years with NYU studying cancer cells on the left and healthy cells on the right. Um, to see what's going on and how do we understand what's happening at the cellular level and up it to 
the higher levels, and I think there's a lot of coaching in this, so listen deeply for, for what you're hearing. Um, what it says is that when cells are in a state of cancer, they're territorial. They break away from the pact. Um, it could be employees in a company, it could be the CEO, it could be anybody who has pulled away and doesn't know how to get back in, so now they're outside. And being outside causes the cells to have tremors of all sorts and um, be unable to connect, just like human beings that we might be coaching who don't feel like they're in the crowd or who have such a dominant role that they're being rejected if that's the culture. Um, and so on the left side is territorial behavior, on the right side is healthy behavior, vital behavior. It's the I and the we working together. That cells know the importance, and you say, how could you say that? You know, um, I want to. I'm translating both the metaphor of what my husband learned, but the reality of what he learned. Um, that cells need to connect. That is what makes us healthy. When they disconnect, they go on to the left, and all sorts of disease states appear. This one being cancer. Um, that the cells feel like foe when they try to reach out, and nobody responds, or they feel like friend, and that friend experience at the human level produces tons of oxytocin, which is the bonding hormone. So if we feel connected to others, including our clients, in fact, I always say you have to fall in love with your clients in order to build the right kind of environment chemically for you to, um, to connect with them. And when you do, that opens up their prefrontal cortex heart connection. And the kind of work that you do when that part of the brain is open, which I'll show, um, is, is paramount to being a great coach. So the friend, the I inside the we is on that side. So this is what my husband's research taught me and I seriously at times knock on my head and say I can't believe that this is happening, but it is. This is what's happening on the cell level and connected to the companies that you work with. Um, D is dialogue. And you're going to see the word DNA appear here, interestingly enough, um, that when cells are healthy, there is a dialogue. The little cells put up their flags, that's like raising their hands, and this is the words that I got from my husband, so these are scientific terms. Put up their flags, the immune system listens, um, responds, they have a conversation, and the cells get help about what their questions are down on the ground. That's that big, uh, big view, small view. Um, however, when, when there's cancer, and this happens to be cancer cells, when, they're, um, when the cells are cancerous, the little flags raise their hand, and the immune system says, I'm too busy, I'm out there on the street, I'm doing other things, I don't even hear you. And all of these questions get unanswered and there's a frustration. Those little flags kind of die away and they break away and all of a sudden they are not connected anymore. Um, the next thing that happens is that when um, cells are connected, so these are two cells, not the immune system now with the cell, but two cells, they have a conversation and what they do is exhibit or give off contact inhibition factor which is what my husband studied and it's the chemistry of connection at the cellular level and when the cells talk to each other they talk about what they need from each other and that's part of again what coaching is about it's enabling to understand what people need from each other and with the clients that you're coaching are not exhibiting that kind of behavior it could have some negative effect and move the relationships over to the left side without even realizing it. So responding to people's needs, having these conversations is what healthy is. Um, walking away and saying, I can't hear you, or just not listening and talking over people, and I'll show you some human behaviors that, that resemble that, it creates an unhealthy environment. And the last one is about adapting to the world around us as it's changing. And the cells on the right um, reach out to the world around, bring it in, learn it together, study it, figure out what they need to do in order to grow and develop because with epigenetics we don't stop growing. And on the left side, the cancer cells, instead they're frustrated, they're hanging out by themselves, they want to be connected and so what they do is they put angiogenic roots, they connect into the body, but that weakens the immune system. They literally take the health out of the body. So there is a big difference here. Jeff, I'm just going to stop and see if either there are any questions or you have comments. Uh, feel free to ask at this point. Um, yeah, no, this is fascinating. I'm kind of, uh, what I love about what you're doing is drawing these parallels between uh, interdependency at a really molecular level and also interdependency on a much broader, um, you know, human level and mm -hmm. how they really map. The, the same yeah. processes take place in the brain, in the body, in the cells, and then on a broader level in between us as humans. So it just... Yeah. On, a, mm. some, on some level, it is so logical, but right. it's also uh, kind of a revelation. So, it, yeah. Um, 
So questions that people are having, let's see, <laughs> someone wants to know a little bit more about your husband, which I think yeah. is probably reasonable, given yeah. that you mentioned he was doing cancer research. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he he then, was, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Just one other question is where, where can they read more about this if you have any recommendations? Okay. Um, the first answer is that, that Rich was um, uh, consulting to all of the pharmaceutical companies at the time, 40, when he, 40 pharmaceutical companies when he started out. Pfizer picked him to join them and to launch Procardia, which was their most successful drug. Um, he went on to work with a bunch of other companies, including helping launch AMA's um, uh, big company that was doing filtration for products. And then he got brought into a big project, this one, for 10 years um, in the beginning of 2000, uh, in the 2000, like 2001 or two, um, and the research was seminal. People didn't believe what they, by the way, what they came up with. Um, denied it, denied it, denied it, and then finally, like 15 years later, they started to realize that what is going on at this level underneath, underpins, underpins all cancer. And it took them, again, because it takes, when you have some new ideas, this was innovative revolutionary and so now there's a lot more consideration he's still he's now the president of our company um, and he oversees the neuroscience development of what we're bringing into um, our conversational intelligence work so thank goodness for him and uh, by the way I met him I had three days and got and we got married I just knew he was the right one <laughs> and now wow. we're doing it it took us a while to get all this off the ground together but I just knew that he had the ability to deal with this level of change in neuroscience that was going on. So anyway, that's the, that's the story. Um, I wrote this up for uh, an article about this, was, which ended up as one of the best articles in Leader to Leader, which is Francis Hesselbein's organization. So you might be able to find it online. Let's start there. But that's where it was published. Um, and her her journal, it was a, it's a journal review process to get to get this kind of stuff in. So that's great. Yep. Yeah. So. Yeah, how do we shape the space for elevating trust? Where does that fit into all of this? Um, and we're going to talk about that from many different angles. <clears throat> what I have here is a, uh, and I believe this is in my book. Yes, it is in my book. Um, that trust, if you look at the right side, this is where when we trust somebody, we see reality more clearly. We're more open to engage. We will reveal more when we trust. So we'll be able to, it's called opening the kimono or share more, be more transparent. Um, we expect the unexpected means that we're prepared for things not happening the way they happen and our prefrontal cortex is open which deals with the unexpected and change and so it's very much open and ready to help us um, deal with whatever's happening that we didn't predict. Instead of getting agitated and uh, activating our lower brain where we produce a lot of cortisol, um, that doesn't happen when we're in trust. If it did, you wouldn't be able to access trust because trust lives in the prefrontal cortex and heart connection. We'll assume the best about people. We'll look with an open heart. Um, all these things are, are wonderful when we feel that way. That's what trust feels like. Um, we interpret the facts. We don't make up as many assumptions. Um, we'll tell the truth to other people, and we say yes all the time, as much as we can, to truth-telling. And if it's not there, we actually share that, it's, that we're not able to tell the truth and why, and in doing that, we're transparent and we bring the relationship back to trust. So that's the good side. The side on the left is when we are in distrust. And you could see the same words with, we, we reveal less. You know that feeling of withholding when you don't trust somebody. We look for mistakes and say, yes, they are stupid, just like I thought. <laughs> we assume the worst about people. We look with caution. We interpret with fear. We tell secrets because we want other people to talk to. And we yes people say, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do it. But we don't. So we add to the distrust. You can see in this picture that, whoops, where did it go? I don't know how to go back. Hold on. Yes, I do. Um, that what happens here is that when we're in distrust, look at the eyes on the left. It, there's a redness to them. Um, we are nearsighted. We literally cannot see around us. So know that the brain changes when we're feeling distrust because we're in more and protect. Our brain is being absorbed with the need to protect ourselves from other people. Um, on the other side, we see green when we're in trust. We not only see green or look for better things to happen, but we end up with a long view, so our eyes literally can see further. When research has been done about how much we see when we're in fear versus how much we see around us, our perspective shifts dramatically. So this is really important to study, and 
um, and talk to clients about so that they understand what's happening when they get pulled into an amygdala hijack. Um, more cortisol spews then and uh, on the left and then oxytocin, uh, according to Bruce McEwen from Rockefeller University, studied this for his life, oxytocin unbeknownst to most people because we thought it was connected with women nursing is the more frequently produced um, neurotransmitter in the brain and helps us connect um, with other human beings. By the way, just so that people know, I have not stopped learning. I'm back in a PhD program that's bringing connecting neuroscience and anthropology. Um, and these are what we call, we have to write um, re, uh, any kind of essay that they give us. We have to be able to study it and we do sometimes three essays. We read all these essays and then we have to write our interpretations of them. This one I thought was interesting because um, it took place in 2003. Um, Hendricks, whose background is extraordinary as a neuroscientist, he said social support and oxytocin interact to suppress cortisol and subjective responses to psychological stress. The essence of this is that when we, work, when we as coaches extend our care to people, our concern, um, empathy is now, this is a very provocative thought, so you may or may not have heard about it, but then there's a new book on, uh, that's out about empathy being where we connect with other human beings, but we mimic in a sense their pain. And so if you're uh, a client and I say, I feel your pain in whatever way we say it, that as a coach is not enough because it's connecting us pain to pain and it doesn't lift your, your client out of pain. When you add to that, let's talk about how I can support you. The, the, just the idea of supporting, that social support um, enables to us to, in our brain, suppress cortisol. That's huge. You need to know that as a coach because if you don't and you're just empathizing with people, then the possibility is that you're going to activate cortisol because that's, that's where their pain is. So don't stop there. Talk about and, and in what ways you can be more supportive to help them. And all of a sudden, they will gain a ability to suppress or downregulate the cortisol and upregulate their connection with you of oxytocin and it will enhance your support and your role with them, um, they will confide in you more, they'll open up their, and be more transparent about what's on their mind because you're not somebody that, that shares their pain alone, you're somebody that enables them to move and learn how to move out of pain. Here's the tiny URL, um, which I will give you so that you can give it to everybody and uh, they'll hear it also, but it's, uh, it's a http colon forward slash forward slash tinyurl, one word, dot com, forward slash mo3nlvj, all in lowercase. If you haven't found tinyurl, it's fabulous. For This one had like 36 words in it. So um, here's another research that just came out in 2016. Really fascinating because things change all the time. It talks about, uh, and I put it in here, how mother and baby form a synchrony. I'm saying it because it's something that happens when we have a child. In fact, um, there are David Haig from Harvard University believes that the rhythm starts when babies are in their mother's stomach, um, that they start to connect with each other in some rhythmic way, and it's different. Certain genes get turned on and off. Um, that's a whole other thing, but you could look up David Haig as well from Harvard. Um, but there's a synchrony that forms. What's fascinating is how many different parts of the network are connected. And a lot of us didn't think that the hypothalamus or that um, part of our brain that is known for, like the, the amygdala that is known um, for experiencing pain, how could that ever be connected with mother and infant bonding? What's fascinating is that our brain, the amygdala, fires off when we feel like we're not like somebody. It's called the like me, not like me part of the brain. Um, and it turns out with babies and moms, it's that same feeling of, like me or not like me, that starts at a very infant level because it's hardwired into who we are. And so if people are around the baby and they're being taken care of by nurse, nursing people or other people or held by people where the baby doesn't feel that they're like them in some way, and this is almost a chemical response, they can, the baby can produce more um, of the neurotransmitters of fear like cortisol, but if they feel connected, in many cases they do with moms, um, then it opens up the prefrontal cortex, but the hypothalamus or the part of the brain that is connected with fear has a language it, connect, it listens to. Um, it, it tries to understand what's going on in the connection. Um, it has enough of a brain to translate that for us 
to know if we should feel comfortable or not comfortable. Um, and in this text it says, we hypothesize that dopamine secretion within the medial amygdala network recruits the network to support human bonding, unlike what we thought last year that the amygdala does not support. In fact, it does because it help, helps us sort out who is like us and who is not like us. And when we feel like we're like somebody, then it opens up the prefrontal cortex, which you see in here, the medial prefrontal cortex and um, prefrontal cortex. So these are the kind of things that I look at all the time to try to better understand trust, because trust sits in here. Um, if you don't uh, connect with someone because you don't think they're like you, then you're not going to bond. And then in companies, and that's why I'm mentioning this, it's so important as coach, as a coach to help your coaches understand that they could be um, on paper the best and smartest people in the world, but if they don't engage in behaviors and activities, or if you don't help them, or if you need to know more about what creates bonding, and that's why I use this, even though it's about, um, it's about infants, what's here is the basis of what makes for great coaching. Um, so the role of the amygdala, it says here, it, it fires up uh, not only for goal-relevant information, um, rather than simply to threat, it's more like, uh, likely that the amygdala is responding to people in group or out of group who have some kind of social value, um, which gives much more, quote, thinking power and discernment to this part of the brain than we ever thought. I'm not going to spend too much time on here because um, I think I want to get into some other things now, which is really, so I I'll stop for a second, but what does all this mean is what we're going to do next, and I'm going to give you some deeper dives into seeing what goes on the brain and also give you some tools that you can use with your clients. So any questions that are really, really important before I jump on? Because I know I'm eating up a lot of time when I'm telling my stories, <laughs> Jeff. So Oh, it's great. I think it's okay. really fabulous that you're sort of going back and forth between some of the earlier research and how it's evolved mm -hmm. um, and some of the current, current studies uh, of how it's all inter interconnected. Mm -hmm. There's a, there is a really interesting question coming through. Um, uh, Judy Bertado, I love your question. So I just want to share this question, which I think we all grapple with as coaches, which is that, you know, this what you're talking about is sort of the, the neuroscience now confirming what many of us as psychologists have, have called attachment theory. Mm -hmm. um, you know, David, David Drake used, recently did a session at a conference I was at, uh, and he's a specialist in narrative coaching. Yeah. And he did, yeah. A, did a session. Yeah, he did a session on attachment theory um, and how it's sort of the foundation of building rapport and that that's something that those of us that have studied, um, you know, early childhood type ad adaptability have been aware of for a long time. And now they're really seeing, as you just described, how it, ha how it actually works in the brain. Mm -hmm. And what Judy is asking is, if, if this is true, we also find that there are some people that are skeptical, some people that are reserved, some people that are more deliberative and actually take longer to build that trust than others. That in other words, we, we, may, we may all have the same brain mechanics going on, but we're not all the same in terms of mm -hmm. um, the pace or willingness that we have to um, build that connection. So I'm, she's curious about how do you work for that? How do you work with that? How do you account for the fact that people are different in their willingness to trust. My favorite story is someone I, I was given three months to coach at Verizon. They only gave me three months because um, it turns out that this particular leader had um, been so unaware of certain things that he was doing. And he was a, such a big teller, never an asker. And his one guy got into the, was put in the hospital for a heart attack. And he said, I'll give up my 25 year pension not to work with him. This was a, lot, a leader that was so set on, his, he wasn't as skeptical of other people, but he was set on his ways. So let's say in a sense that I was wanting to, in the beginning, give him new insights about what, how he works and operates, and I realized there was resistance to it. He was skeptical of what I was saying. He was so certain that he was right. So he had a double whammy for me to deal with. And so I went along in understanding his way. I stepped into his world. I started to listen and learn why putting pressure on people to be successful. He said I, he was the best practice leader, too. And uh, he put a lot of pressure on these people to be best practice with him, including working on Sunday, because uh, in Europe they didn't celebrate um, one of our holidays, and so he got his team, and I think it was Thanksgiving, on the line. Anyway, I let him speak and speak and speak to 
be able to share with me his point of view. I didn't try to go into what I call positional conversations and uh, explain to him why being different is better and better is better for him. And I was not trying to impose uh, positions on him. I just let him wear out his his beliefs. And then I said, "Are you willing to experiment with me?" And he said, what do you mean? And I said, I just want you to change one thing, only one thing, and just see what happens. Because he knew that his team was not happy with him and they were actually fearful of him. And so I said, just instead of telling, ask. And he said, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, well you're going to have a meeting, ask them what they want on the agenda. You're going to have a meeting. When they come in, have them ask more. And so I tried to shift a pattern that was his tell pattern into an ask pattern. And I did that to shift the chemistry. They, people in the room were skeptical that this guy could ever, ever, ever become a good leader. They couldn't wait until he left the company. They had been hiding for so long how they felt about him. So they, were, they had data that said that he's never going to change. And this one change from tell to ask, his people called me the next day and said, what did you give my boss to drink? Literally, what did you give my boss to drink? So all of a sudden, their skepticism now was curiosity. And from that, we had the first meeting of all of his team being able to give him feedback in the meeting and talking about strategies for change. It turned out that the next year he was the best practice leader by far, but he was sensitive now. They were no longer skeptical because he was consistent with showing up a different way. So I, I don't know if, if that answers all, all the questions, but that's, that's how I've dealt with the skeptical person because it was skepticism on both sides. He didn't want to believe that anything but his approach was the right one, and they didn't want to believe that he could change. And now you have two skeptical you know, energies in the room, and I had to find one way to break through it, and it worked, thank God. So mm -hmm. I hope Great that's story. helpful as a, coach, as a coaching story. Yeah. Yeah, there's, a, there's another question. You, before you go on, just to clarify, um, mm -hmm. a couple of people are asking, are, are the, is the basis of trust a like me versus not like me judgment that we make in the brain, or is that overly simplistic? It, it's no, no, no. It's not simplistic. It's part of it. Um, okay. Because that's, this, that's the thing you have to step through is because the brain is hardwired for this. This is a button in the brain, the rostromedial prefrontal cortex. Um, if, if we show up as being uh, not like me, then it's going to be harder. You have to deal with that in order to really begin to build trust because people always, the brain goes back to that and says, you think you want to get along with this person, but don't, don't trust that. <laughs> that's that's yeah. what your brain wants you to do, but I'm telling you brain, you know, I'm telling you. So I have a lot of exercises that I do with teams, um, with individuals to help activate um, that part of the brain and shift it from the not like me to the like me. So think about all of you who do team building, think about, you know, things, know that what you're doing when people get along in your team building in ways that have them find things in common with each other, you're literally able to switch that part of the brain. It's not hard fixed. It's situational. And so know that it's there to activate because it will help you with the team immeasurably, immeasurably. Right. I, I, don't, I, can't, I can't even put in a, enough significance on it. Will, any major transformation I've done where one at a, at a big museum where they had three other consultants that had come in, they spent money, they couldn't get results, and they were fabulous consultants. Um, but there was so much energy around not like me because the fear, and I, I won't go into it because we don't have time now, but the essence was I flipped the switch and they produced the most dramatic results that ever this, the director of the museum had seen and he wanted to save all our flip charts and make it the art of transformation as a result of it. So that's the kind of stuff that I look for is how do we learn enough about the science of how the brain works and how people connect so that we get radical results because there's so many things that tell us as coaches you have to spend three weeks and a thousand repetitions and you know you have to do a lot of start, stops, and continues. Well, the brain doesn't work on start, stop, and continue. That's how we work at the macro level of human beings. And I don't believe that that's the strategy that creates change. And I know I'm going off target a little bit, but that I just want people to know how strongly I feel about some of new ways of thinking that understanding the brain gives us. The brain is about upregulating and downregulating. That's the chemistry of the brain, and that's what we teach. And once you learn how to take a leader and help them downregulate something instead of stopping it, um, it's like stopping smoking, and uh, it's hard. And so downregulating some behaviors and upregulating and have them be an experimenter, a mentor of the experiment with you, and notice what happens differently 
when they do that and how much easier it is to coach someone because, hey, I could lower something. I, I don't have to speak up 10 times. Count how many times you force yourself into the meeting. Okay, you do 10. All right, now I'd like you to downregulate. Let's just do eight this time. Do you want to do eight or do you want to do less? What do you want to do? In other words, giving that part, that this approach to a client can help them make change and they don't have to do it 14,000 times to try to hardwire the body a different way. If they're doing it that way, they're focusing, the coach is focusing on the neocortex and not opening up the prefrontal cortex where change is much easier. You just have to speak the language of the brain to make it happen. Is all this making sense? Because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm telling coaches on the line because I love working with coaches um, and we have things in common and so I'm sharing with you at the level, uh, a high level of as much as I can in the short amount of time and I hope it's making sense. So. Um, what this is all about, and do you, you think so? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay, and I, and I trust that if there's anything that we really need to address, that you'll pull me out of what I'm saying, and then we'll, we'll address it. So, what I focus I on is, thank you, thanks, Jeff. Um, that human beings go forward. We want to be great. That's what makes us feel good, especially in in face with our um, peers and colleagues. Um, so, getting to the next. I, I, I mean, if you ever seen anybody who wakes up in the morning, looks in the mirror and says, okay, who am I going to, how bad am I going to make my day today? You know, I mean, it just doesn't happen. The brain is, is set to grow and to be great. So let's, let's give it what it needs. So um, getting to the next level of greatness depends on the quality of the culture, which depends on the quality of relationships, which depends on the quality of conversations. Everything happens through conversation. And now you've seen that it's cells talk with each other, human beings talk with each other, teams and organizations. And God only knows what's happening to us. Maybe we have people on, in other planets that are talking to us, giving us hopefully new ideas about how to make this world work better. Um, so why conversational intelligence? This is um, from Pentagon spokesman Robert McClaskey. I know you believe, you understand what you think I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard is not what I meant. And, uh, and so nine out of 10 conversations fail to hit the mark. What I've learned in my research over 35 years um, and so what is this body of work called conversational intelligence? It's not emotional intelligence, although we share interest in emotions and understanding them and how to up and down regulate, at least in my language, that's what I say. Conversational intelligence is the hardwired and learnable ability to connect. Important, that's the first place. And then when we do connect, how do we navigate and move with others and grow? And we now know that when human beings have healthy connections, um, by the way, this is not only a necessity in, in resilient organizations in the face of change, but in families and everything that you can think of, think about. Um, I even where I get my hair done, my, my um, hairdresser was uh, just having a baby and after she did, she said to me, I've learned so much from you and I don't think I'm connecting with my daughter well enough. And she said, I'm going to spend the next six months. We talked about what she could do and all of a sudden she said, I could feel it. I could feel it was working. Thank you. Because she kind of knew something was out of place and didn't know what to do about it. So what to do about it is, Conversational intelligence begins with elevating the level of trust that you create with others and ends with the quality of interactions and conversations that result. I'm going to show you things in here that show that you need to have trust first because if you don't, then you're opening up more of the neocortex and the um, uh, limbic brain where you have all information stored and relationships stored and interactions. The hippocampus and the limbic brain are more about the people side. It's the tribal part of our brain. Neocortex is more about the knowledge part of our brain, if we don't open up the prefrontal cortex, we will recycle knowledge and think that we're smart and we could be much smarter. So if you've gone into the room and you've facilitated sessions, team building sessions where people are coming up with new ideas and you have people put their ideas up on the wall and the best ideas go here and people pick out the best ideas and you all start to sort them, here's the top 10, let's go for the first one. As far as I'm concerned, that's neocortex innovation. It's not prefrontal cortex innovation. They're very, very, very different. And the results that you get are limited on the side of the neocortex or it's expansive to the point that you cannot believe how much your organization is changing if you're doing the prefrontal cortex. There are different connections in the brain, um, the energy connections between people and amongst people on a team that are operating at level three conversations are very, very different than those that are operating it in the neocortex. So. How does trust play in this conversation? So um, where did trust and distrust show up in the brain? What's the impact? So I want you to see this. I had this made specially to show you what happens when people are not connecting. 
at the moment of contact where they feel distrust. The not like me, like me part of the brain, as I mentioned, the rostromedial prefrontal cortex is not um, opening up. It reduces sharing the temporal parietal junction because we're afraid to share with people we withhold. And so whatever you're doing, if cortisol is high because people are afraid of each other, it could be a 26-hour shelf life or more depending on if you're ruminating. Um, sometimes leaders fall into the tell cell yell or addicted to being right, which um, are syndromes that prevent people from connecting and sharing and, and really doing the great work together. Um, let me hey, get Judith? back to Yeah? Can I just stop you for one second? What does that mean, 26-hour shelf life? Oh, I'm not that means, quite sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. So some people think that if you have a amygdala hijack, that um, that it it gives you a cortisol high, and maybe it lasts for five minutes or you know whatever length of time. If you have a significant um, uh, amygdala hijack, that cortisol it's been trained over the six billion years that we've been around from animals to to humans that that part of our brain has been literally shaped by epigenetics that cortisol has a very powerful impact on us and it lasts longer. And if we ruminate, if we think in our heads, like we coach people that are very often in their heads and remember memories and get distracted in life because the bad things show up all the time, that's activating the cortisol to live longer in the brain, even though we don't see it. And you'll start to see the behaviors that your coaches have when they've been hijacked. You know, they'll... they'll so it can last 26 hours is what you're saying. The flood oh, yeah. Of yeah. Cortisol. The flood yeah, of that's cortisol. very interesting because I can think of examples where even in my own life or with my clients, you have a very small trigger or what appears to be a very small upset and it kind of ruins your whole weekend. Right. Yeah, it comes back. <laughs> and so what and you're you, saying is that it's, yeah. it's, you sit with it much longer than, yeah. um, than you may even realize. And I don't know about you, but do you, if you go to somebody and they say, and they give you empathy, which is the thing where they, they say, oh, I can feel your pain, and I know what it's like to feel this way, and it's, you're feeling you know, very bad. Now we've learned that empathy alone just reinforces you staying in that cortisol because they say, yeah, and you say, yeah, and you feel bad, to, you know, and you're feeling bad. And does it help you? Well, the new, again, the new thinking is that if you say, what can I do to help you? What, this is your, the coaching voice coming out now. You can be very okay. powerful in downregulating. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. That's why coaching is so important. That's why right. you know we need to do it differently. So um, let me go to the next one. So when we're um, connecting with another person, and then the like me, not like me, rostromedial prefrontal cortex feels it, picks it up. We our energetic fields, especially within ten feet of each other, we're picking up these fields. This is where the mirror neurons come in. Um, we are sharing with other people now, we're opening up, we're discovering uh, our prefrontal cortex and heart open up. So this is, this is the description of the, the mirror neurons that I talked about earlier. There's a belief that this happens and when people start to say, I was just thinking about that before you mentioned it, you know, we've all had that. That's an example of what's going on in the brain. We're in that prefrontal cortex and we're connecting and starting to pick up. When you think of a person and they call you on the telephone, um, you have a relationship that opens up that part of their mind and heart, and it's really powerful, and it's what I hope we're heading into as human beings, that if we looked at each other a thousand years from now, that we'd be more of that than we would be more of the protect behaviors. Okay. Um, so, again, in summary, um, at the moment of contact, uh, we have what are called interaction dynamics. I mentioned the Verizon leader, push and pull. Those dynamics are energies that are that will come up in our next section on um, the um, conversational matrix. But I want to confirm here that this is what's going on. So we're sending and receiving, we pick up the energy, we open or close. It's trust or distrust. Distrust lives in the lower brain. Um, trust lives in the upper brain, the prefrontal cortex. Distrust lives down there in the primitive brain, according to some scientists. Others will say it's the primitive in the limbic brain. We know that it produces, as you see red, it produces Cortisol, where what's coming from the uh, prefrontal cortex is oxytocin. It's my belief that the following things, not all of these have been 100% confirmed. It's I'm projecting into the future based on what I know, that the prefrontal cortex is a place of wisdom. Um, it is, uh, we've been told that it, you can't, it doesn't open up very much until people are 21. I don't think that that's true since I've been part of research with kids that are six and seven years old from teachers who believe that it, you can tap into that part of the brain when kids are young and we see 
their level of insight and wisdom that comes out. So it's wisdom, integrity, strat and we need more in integrity in the world right now, by the way. Our prefrontal cortexes are being closed down by the world's conversations. Um, we have to fight back and step above this and reach out and connect. Yeah. Yep. Just a quick observation and, and, and uh, comment, for, mm -hmm. comment on this. I'm wondering, um, you mentioned that they, the scientists think that the prefrontal cortex gets engaged and open in, uh, around, what did you say, 19 or 18, something like yeah. that? Yeah, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering, I'm wondering what, what about early childhood? Because early in early childhood, people tend to be, I mean, kids tend to be very trusting. It's almost yep. like they start out trusting and then wind up losing some of their trust as they grow. As they grow. Totally. So my, uh, my master's thesis was on just that. And we gave kids the ability to um, learn how to speak and read on a typewriter called the Edison Responsive Environment. And we set out to build a, an, a spirit of trust with 31 kids in our, our nursery school. I was trained for six months to lower my cortisol, learn how to manage my own, and then when I connected with them to keep myself in a space of prefrontal cortex heart connection. Um, and so the kids went onto the talking typewriter. So I built, tr I started to activate their trust networks early. And I believe I was activating the prefrontal cortex because that's where trust lives in the brain. And so with that full intention, and the, this research is online, is online on the web, by the way, um, the end result was that 31 kids, even if they were with an 89 IQ, by connecting with them through the prefrontal cortex heart connection, which you, they said you couldn't do, um, these kids' uh, IQs advanced a minimum of 15 points. It's never been heard of before because people haven't done this kind of research before. And when kids went to school, we followed them for 10 years, and their ability to be more with the prefrontal cortex and heart open. They were, the teachers would say they were a minimum of two years advanced, and they couldn't describe it because they didn't know how to describe it. It was different than other kids. And they went on to go to college regardless of where they lived and where they grew up and what their IQ was. So there's so much we don't know. And I'm so glad you stopped me because we need to do more research. And in my kids' school, they gave kids thinking that only somebody that's using prefrontal cortex could do. And 100% of the kids got it. It's like once it, for them, once that part of the brain opened up, wow, they were like yeah. geniuses. So amazing yeah, question. It just, it, just, it just strikes me that so often it's kids that, that have this natural tendency to trust others. Yep. And then that it is eroded by the culture of the school system and by the political environment and their parents and it. so on. You so got it. So it's an interesting cycle. It's, it's like anyway, even parents, yeah, no, 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 question. no, thank you for bringing that up because a lot of people haven't made it and you're make, helping me really reinforce why what I learned at that early place has a place in the world now and that I want more, more than ever to get education to start using these technologies because, right. you know, we, we can't, you were so right about trust in the brain and the young kids, so right. Um, and so that's what we, we get from this part of the brain, empathy and now we call it compassion as well, foresight literally being able to say what the future is going to be like, insight and tr trust. And, um, and so this is, on the left side, that's the cortisol producing versus oxytocin. Um, and it's fight, flight, freeze, appease is the lower brain, the primitive brain. And according to researchers, trust lives in the prefrontal cortex and distrust lives in the lower brain. And that's why they're not versions of the same. They are extremely different, defined by different types of chemistry. Um, can, can you tell me, I want to look and see what our time is. Oh my goodness. So we have, um, you wanted me to leave time for us to talk with people um, about this and we have 15 minutes. So you, I want you to guide me about when we, when we start doing more of that or when you start doing more of the interpreting. Um, but these are the conversational cocktails. This is what, when I told the Verizon story that, um, you know, the leader opened up before was adrenaline and cortisol versus dopamine and, and adrenaline and oxytocin and all those positive chemistries. These are uh, conversational cocktails. Um, and um, I think this is going to be, you know, where I can go, which is the levels, Jeff. Um, mm -hmm. But, but um, we, I, I've studied and studied and studied. I've gone to Dubai and China and Japan and, and you name it, uh, South Africa. Um, to, and, and the United States to study, is there, are there patterns that are taking place in the brain that enable us to get to trust better and what do we need to do to get there? And I've discovered that when I gave talks all over the world, um, 
I was this these levels have been confirmed. It kind of blew me away because um, two of them you'll recognize, and the third one was the one that I thought was the emerging one in our world today, and that's level three transformational co-creating conversations. And the more we help people move into that level together, the faster companies heal, the more they produce cre creative solutions that are bigger and better than anything we've seen before. So defying conventional thinking. Um, so the three levels, um, transactional, positional, and transformational, they're all important. So even though you go up to a higher level of energetic connection with people, which is what this is showing, you need to know that the world uses all three, we need all three, um, but we get stuck in the, the first two too often. Um, the first one is tell and ask. Again, these are interaction dynamics. Um, if we just do telling, uh, it, it erodes the relationship. You can't trust somebody who's constantly telling you what to do. So embedded in here are clues about what creates trust and distrust. Advocate and inquire. We teach people persuasion at, at, at Harvard. And, and it's an important skill. Advocate your point of view so people know what it is. Inquire into others so that we get to engage with them in a fair way. Um, often what happens is that leaders get stuck in advocating. And then they get frustrating that people aren't responding. And then they start to put uh, punishments of different types on it. Leaders need to understand these patterns when they're in them, when they're not in a healthy version of them, so that they can learn how to uh, reshape their conversations with others. And this is the important, one of the many important roles that a coach plays. Um, and this is, the last one is sharing and discovering. And that is where we trust. And again, when we open the prefrontal cortex, when we lay down behaviors with each other that show that we come through, that we support somebody, um, that we're not trying to put them under the bus, all the things that we know of that are the behaviors of trust, um, when we live with share and discover, which is I want to share what's on my mind, I want to discover what's on your mind, that behavior rather than the knowledge, I want to advocate a position as knowledge, telling and asking as knowledge, it confirms what we know. Um, so opening up this part of the brain with each other to get there in level three, we have to build trust. So we have to have behaviors that um, enable us to, uh, to demonstrate that we trust and are trusted. So number one is confirming what we know. Number two is defending what we know. And number three is discovering what we don't know. So what is distrust? If we want to learn about trust, we also have to learn about distrust to see what happens. So how does distrust show up in the brain and what is its impact? So we know that when people fall into, again, the one side of the interaction dynamics, like tell, sell, yell, um, it causes us to distrust that person. And we say they're out for their own best interest, not mine. Um, when we have somebody who's addicted to being right, again, their ego is saying, I'm important. Um, we distrust them. So these are two of the con conversational syndromes that lead people to distrust leaders, and leaders need to understand that. It's, uh, again, going around the world, I haven't had any country yet where people haven't said, oh my God, you know, now I understand why I don't trust so-and-so. Um, it's because of these extreme behaviors. Um, so if we look at where these happen in the brain, the prefrontal cortex is, is um, lit up. Um, the primitive brain is down at the bottom. Distrust lives in the primitive brain, trust in the prefrontal cortex. The amygdala is located in the limbic brain. Um, we call that amygdala hijack, which is a combination, by the way, a union of the amygdala and the primitive brain working together to cause that hijack. And that, that's the fight, flight, uh, freeze, or appease are the behaviors, we know that they come from, that they're hardwired in the primitive brain. The amygdala is the one that has to sort out, do I trust you or not trust you, um, before it opens up. So those are important as well. Um, oxytocin and cortisol are the two bookends for a lot of our social interactions. Um, I think how to elevate trust in teams. Again, I have to look. I have just a few few more minutes. Um, here's the I wanted to give people an exercise. Um, I can send you the one pager that they can have um, to work with. Um, and this is one that talks about how do you establish a foundation of trust. Um, this is what coaches need um, to focus on in order to build people from distrust to trust. And in doing so, these activities, they are conversational, they're physical, they're mental, they're spiritual, they're heart built. Um, these start to give the message to other human beings um, that we care, that we really trust each other. So the first one is, um, and the intention behind it, it's transparency. Um, this quells the threats and fears in the, uh, in the brain. 
when people can sit in a room and share what's really on their mind and be transparent, it could be about their life, which is amazing when leaders are not connecting and then you have them share something about their life and they go, oh my God, I never knew that about you. You were always blah, 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 and now I can see you are a human being. So transparency is the first one and the intention is how can I create a safe environment to be more transparent about it could be desired outcomes, share threats that stand in my way, whatever it is that's the topic that hasn't been discussed by being transparent. If you do nothing else, this and do this with your clients as well. Um, it changes the chemistry in the brain. It quells the amygdala and activates the prefrontal cortex and heart. To support that, focus on relationship. Listen to connect, not judge or reject. Most of listening is you're listening to see where you're going to say something next, or you're listening in your head to judge that person, to in some ways say, oh, they're not as good as they think they are, whatever it is. Listening to connect is this thing that I learned at, at Drexel, which is listening, it's not judging, it's not rejecting. And we have to work on it because that slips in a lot in, in, our, in our way of communicating with human beings. So how do you establish this level of rapport, prime the conversations for mutual trust, openness and respect, establishing a power with others, not a power over others. That alone, again, that physical space of power with or power over um, can change the level of oxytocin versus cortisol. And so you as coaches need to be noticing these kinds of things. Like my, uh, one of my clients that I worked with at Dryers and Edie's Grand Ice Cream, Gary Rogers, who's the CEO, um, he would come into a room, undo his tie, sit down with people, he wouldn't stand up, and he was listening to the team meetings and he'd go around every place and then he'd say, you decide, because they would always look to him for final, in the beginning, for final answers. They have to, he trusted them to be able to come up with the right things as long as they were in level three conversations. And they did most of the time. And when they didn't, you know, he would share that he didn't believe them, but say, you decide, it's up to you. If you want to, if you believe in this, do it. So it's how we go about sharing our sense of we trust, we believe in others. Um, these, that that uh, example is something that's so powerful to leaders to know that it instills trust in the whole organization when people can make mistakes, take risks, and not be punished for it. Um, again, number three is understanding. And again, listening to understand um, is different. It's standing under. Use that word, reverse it, flip it. It's standing on, under each other's realities. It's not understanding the knowledge. It's not asking questions like, can I confirm that this is what you mean? That's from the neocortex. This is, you have to stand under somebody else's perspective about the world and stand in their shoes and see it from their eyes in order to really activate the prefrontal cortex. Um, it lowers uncertainty, activates empathy and mirror neurons. Um, sharing success is the next one. Again, it's not me imposing my success on you. It's listening to co-create strategies for mutual success, being able to again paint that picture where we're starting to see the world, not it being attached to being right and imposing your view. Um, it's keeping people in discovery as something that you've done together, you've co-created together emerges. Um, these are all activities, these are all exercises, these are the things that help people move into and really understand what building trust means in the brain, what it means in the room, what it means in the hearts of each other. The last one is testing assumptions and telling the truth. When we see that reality gap that I showed appear, how do you close it? And go into it neutrally, go into it to understand and to connect not to judge and evaluate that they're stupid or whatever it is. Um, how do we tell the truth with candor and caring and identifying these reality gaps and so forth so that we can really activate these trust, trust networks and the brain loves you going back in and kind of apologizing. We, that's why we know that when, when people have made a mistake and done something to their customer or their client, those people that got back in and apologize and say, I didn't realize I know you trusted me to get this done, I know that I screwed up, and this is how I'm going to fix it. Believe it or not, when we study relationships that last longer, it's those, even if you have a problem, to go back in and not cover it up, but to share it, reinforces that trust can be dealt with in a really profound and important way, and it builds strongest relationships. So I'm at a place now, Jeff, where I can stop. Uh, people will have this to, uh, for you to give out and to practice. Is there, any, is there any way you can make this, that screen a little bit larger? I don't know. Come, some people are having <coughs> a difficult time it. reading it. Well, they'll, we'll be able to give it out to them. And I was reading okay. it word for word, okay? Yeah. So yeah, it'll, they'll be, be, able it'll to get be part it. of the recorded presentation also. Yep, exactly. Exactly. So, well, we could, could have done more. We're running out of time.
Do you want to take a couple questions? Yo, oh, yeah, that's why I was stopping. You know, and then Great. if you want me to go back, I can do a little bit more of the slides, but I just didn't want to lose the chance to connect with people. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, one person's asking, um, Khalil's asking a really interesting question, which is that a lot of what you're focused on is around the brain, which is exactly what, you know, was the focus of this presentation. Mm -hmm. But he's asking, um, what about somatic work? Where does the body part, or where does the uh, somatic, the physical element enter into the intelligence, into the connection? Oh, my goodness. There, uh, somatic oh, yeah. Component? So, um, so Rebecca Hahn, who's on our team, um, she and, and Tracy and I do the, the sessions, the uh, WBEX sessions, and um, she's a specialist on somatics. We were, that she was just flew in with the team to, to have our conversations for this year's certification. And um, yeah, there's a lot with somatics and a lot of things that you can do because our bodies feel distrust, our bodies feel trust. I would encourage anybody to add them together in the session. So uh, everything, everything that you can teach about somatics is going to be helpful because that's where all this nonverbally, uh, all the feelings about trust live. So I don't, I don't know what else to say about it, but yes, 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 it's important. And to, in, to give it a three-dimensional view, highly uh, credible. So. Yeah, that's, so it's tied together, basically. Oh, <laughs> extremely, extremely. Um, so I have, I have, uh, I had coached a woman at one of the companies that I've been working with for quite a few years, and um, they said, "Tell us." She's very high on. Uh, she's a director now, but we don't know if she should be promoted to a leader because she's content rich. And I said to them, um, "Let me find out." And I went in and did assessments with her, and I realized she was brilliant and needed to be promoted. And I taught her how to build trust physically. Um, with the people. She would go to meetings. She was the only woman in the meetings. <clears throat> she felt uh, she was a little bit introverted and um, also felt overpowered by the people in the room, which were all guys. So from a physical standpoint, um, I said, we're going to start with your body first. And I said, when you go into the meetings, I want you to reach out and, ra and shake the hands, put, make eye contact with everybody on the team before you go into the meeting and shake their hand, basically. So I got the physical activity to take place before she even started to open her mouth and do all the other things. Um, and so what that did is that actually raised her oxytocin herself. It also made a positive connection with people in the room, so there was an appreciation for her mentally, physically, mostly physically before she even came in the room. She noticed that it, her ability to move into conversations was at least three to five seconds quicker um, than she had before when she did this. And it turns out that she kind of got that sense after the first meeting, and by the second meeting she was able to step in because she got ideas very quickly, and she started to put her ideas on the table with the team. It turned out within three sessions people labeled her the idea person. They said, we didn't never knew that you had those ideas because she would always become part of, she would listen inside to what was going on in the conversation and couldn't fit herself back in. The end result of the story was by using that, that was the most important part, the physical part of, of getting her body to reconfigure what it takes to connect and be trusted as a voice in the room. And um, she was the first woman to be promoted to report to the CEO. That means she jumped her boss and her boss's boss and then got to the CEO. And it was all because she started to understand how the physical part, the mental part come together in order to create a sense of trust with others. And they trusted her after that to open up. And her relationships just dramatically shifted. But can you imagine that she ended up, her boss, the first one she jumped, said, didn't we do a great, didn't we do great work with her? That's what he did. He said that he, he was so humble. It was so great that he, he didn't get frustrated by it or upset by it. Uh, maybe he did a little bit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a great story. Mm -hmm. um, Getting a couple of questions that are, I, I think people are trying to avoid going into a political conversation, but, but you mentioned earlier on a story about a fairly difficult leader that you worked with, and I'm, we're getting a couple questions about how to coach an autocrat, mm -hmm. uh, you know, f f folks that obviously might have, you know, in, inherently or deeply rooted trust issues and have a tendency to be very directive in their style. What is your, I mean, you mentioned one story, but I think people are interested in hearing a little bit more about how you've worked with that kind of 
CEO okay. or that kind of leader. Yep. So my favorite story is um, when I was living in Boston for eight years. <clears throat> excuse me. I um, was asked to ex help exit uh, uh, someone who was high in the top team that reported to the CEO of a company that was in the financial world. And this guy was. He was so dominant and aggressive. He was so narcissistic and obnoxious. I have to say that um, I'm still friends with him, so I can tell him that's what I thought. And um, he would be at meetings with clients and take over the room and talk about his cars. And I mean, it was just all the things that we hate about people. And um, so the CEO wanted me to be there when he fired him because he was afraid that this guy might flip out based on his previous behavior. And he was, anyway. So I said, give me two months. He said, what are you kidding? We have to have him around for two months. And I said, my gut is telling me that this is going to be worth it for us. And so he said, okay, but two months only. And my, what you identified when you said autocrat, or uh, I think was the word that you used, it was his voice dominating others that he was so proud of. And so I had to figure that out very quickly. And once I did, I was going to tackle that. And even if I tackled nothing else, I was going to tackle that. And this is how I did it as a coach. We got on the phone so we could talk about our coaching relationship. And he started to go on. And I recorded. He went on for 19 minutes, 26 seconds. And every time I tried to interrupt his voice, um, he didn't hear me. So he had no listening for me. It was all his rambling of his narrative. And um, I finally uh, five times tried to interrupt. And I can even use his name, he said. So Corey. And I and you know I find I said Corey and he didn't hear the I mean I was that was loud and I had to do it five times and then and I marked them so he could tell when they were so I could tell him when they were and I finally got him to listen I said listen we've been on the phone for 19 minutes 26 seconds and I said how do you know I said because I've been taping you I mean I've been you know measuring it and I said these are the time markers where I tried to get in and you heard none of them I said if this is what you're doing to the world and it's only your voice that you hear we have a lot of work to do and we only have two months to do it. And so I was very honest and direct with him. And um, I said, you've got to understand that there's an intention and an impact. And this is what your impact is. And it's not matching your intention. Uh, or your intention is to be the smartest person in the room. And that's not going to work here. So we've got to work this out. And so he started to notice impact. And by the third week, he called me. And he said, I am sick to my stomach. And I said, what is wrong? And he, I said, you need a doctor? And he said, no. He said. I see somebody sitting in a room now across from me who's showing the behaviors that I was demonstrating and it makes me sick to my stomach that people felt that way because I'm feeling what it's like to be on the other side. So his third, what I call the third eye closed. He was able to see intention and impact. I gave him one thing to focus on. I didn't confuse him with lots of things. I said, you've got to learn the impact that you have on others. And he did and he became and, and oh, and then people on his team, the other direct reports, refused to believe that I could work with him and that he would, they said, if you start to work with him, in three weeks he's going to go back to his same self and we're going to have the same problem we've had forever. And I said, well, we'll fix that. And I said, I'm calling a meeting and Corey's going to come in and tell you what he's doing and give you permission to uh, give him feedback if he's not doing it. And I did that. That's the only way I could get this project to move forward. And um, he... Yeah, and he and then he did it, and he stayed with the company for two years. He was flying it every week from Chicago, and he moved back to Chicago after two years because of his son and his, you know, needed to focus on family. Um, but I got to coach his son because his son, he, his son had 167 IQ and had just gotten fired from three or four jobs, and the most recent was from China. And so um, we we did that as well. And I yeah, these are great. I mean, I love my clients. That's what happens. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for sharing that, Judith. I'm, I'm sensitive to the time. We have to yep. wrap. And yep. uh, I just want to let everyone know that um, those of you that wrote comments about wanting the URL and wanting the com uh, this uh, slide on conversational intelligence, this has been recorded. The, the, the webinar uh, materials will all be available on our website. And, we can, and you can also write to me and, uh, or write directly to Judith, and I'm sure she'll be happy to share um, some of some of the research. A lot of people were asking me, uh, Judith, where to find some of the research, like about children and other things. So, if as long as you're open to them following up with you, yep, um, that would be great for you to share yep. that with them. Sure. And uh, sure. super. Yeah. Well, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you from the bottom of my heart, and uh, I love you dearly. I love this work. 
I think everyone really appreciates what you're doing and connecting the science with the practice, making mm -hmm. us all more trustworthy and more enablers of trust in the world. So mm -hmm. um, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you again next month. Mm -hmm. And uh, feel free to send us questions and stay in touch. Have okay. a great day, everyone. Thanks, Judith. Thanks, Jeff. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks.